We want to share with you from the word of the Lord this evening what I feel like the Lord has dealt with me for several days. Uh, I want to talk to you about faithful women. My scripture reading will be from Matthew 27, verse 50. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. The Bible said in verse 52, The graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept rose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. The Bible said in verse 54, When the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly and saying, truly, this was the Son of God. And I want you to draw special attention if you're reading from their scriptures, verse 55 of Matthew 27. Many women were there, beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him. The Bible said, and when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. The Bible said in verse 61, And there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulcher. Then verses 62 through 66, the chief priests and the Pharisees they go to Pilate and they said, we need to seal the tomb because the, this deceiver said he was going to come out of the grave after three days. And, and Pilate said, well, go seal it and set your watch there. Make sure that that is done. And uh, I want you to notice that Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there at the crucifixion. They were there at the tomb when they sealed the tomb. And the Bible tells us in Matthew 28 and 1, the Sabbath day has ended at sundown Saturday evening, and now it is coming on to dawn Sunday morning. Came, the Bible said, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. So they were there at the crucifixion. They were there at the tomb. Uh, uh, when they put Jesus in the, in the, uh, the tomb there, and then they were back before daylight came on Sunday morning. And the Bible said in verse 2, There was a great earthquake caused by the angel of the Lord, and as he descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stones on the door, and he sat upon it. And his countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. For fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. Those guards... Those soldiers that they placed there literally passed out with fear. And the Bible said in verse 5, The angel told the women, Fear not you. I know that you seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. He goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him. The Bible said in verse 8, They left quickly and with fear and great joy and ran to his disciples to bring them word. And as they ran, Jesus met them saying, All hell, they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. And verse 10, Jesus told them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren. Go on into Galilee and you'll see me there. These are wonderful scriptures, and I want us to understand, verse 55, the Bible said there were many women there beholding afar off. The reason they were afar off, the Roman soldiers wouldn't get them, allow them to get any closer. They set a perimeter there. And so those women were beholding afar off, they, and the Bible specifically makes these statements. They were beholding Jesus afar off, they followed Jesus from Galilee. They ministered unto him. Many women, they watched Jesus. They followed Jesus. 
They ministered to Jesus. I, I want to talk to you about Mary Magdalene here for a little while. She was from the town of Magdala on the western shore of Galilee. And the Bible tells us that Mary Magdalene was first mentioned here in Luke, the 8th chapter, verse 1. Jesus went through out every city and village preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. That means there's 13 grown hungry men uh, that are walking and working with Jesus here. And they have appetites. And they need food. And, uh, and they need water to drink and all those things that they need. And the Bible said in verse 2 that we so seldom recognize. And certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and so Susanna, and the Bible makes this statement, and many others which ministered unto him of their substance. I want you to know the church can't function without faithful women. And, and we see here these, as I said, they're 13 grown hungry men and, uh, and they need help. And uh, uh, I was with some a couple yesterday and, and they were talking and, and the husband said, I don't know what I would do if it were not for my wife. I don't even know how to do anything here at this house. And, and so here we had 13 grown men who can't take care of themselves. And these women, these women, they are delivered from these evil spirits and infirmities. And they're very appreciative of what Jesus has done for them. And so they take up their substance. Notice here that Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward. And so this woman's husband was a wealthy man and a prominent person. I mean, you're talking about he was the one who was over all of Herod's uh, cattle and everything that went on in, in Herod's household. And so he had a good income and he had uh, access to a whole lot of food and stuff. Isn't it amazing that God allowed Herod to feed Jesus? And, and the one who tried to kill Jesus when he was born, and here Herod is feeding him, he doesn't even know it. But, oh, I appreciate that there's Mary Magdalene, there's Joanna and Susanna and many others. There are so many of them, you cannot identify them all by name. And this congregation has so many, many precious ladies who are faithful, faithful wives, mothers, faithful to the house of God, faithful to the work of the Lord. Thank you so much for your faithfulness. These faithful women willingly minister to Christ of their substance. I have seen that so many times through my life that these special women will give everything that they've got to the work of the Lord. Their motive was that of gratitude for mighty deliverances that Jesus had done for them. My Lord, how can we not be thankful when the Lord has delivered us? When you think about Mary Magdalene, she had seven demons in her. Can you imagine the trouble, the torment, the terror? She couldn't sleep at night uh, and she was so afflicted by these evil spirits. I don't know. Uh, you know, we can't go back and know and understand all the things that happened to her, but apparently she had many traumatic events that happened in her childhood and her teen years for her to be possessed of seven devils and uh, all of the awful things that she was going through. And that Jesus cast so seven demons out of Mary and she absolutely didn't want to go back to the drudgery and the horror of being demon possessed again. The torment of demon possession never gave her ease or relief night or day, 24-7 she was tormented. So Mary Magdalene was full of gratitude to Jesus, her great deliverer who healed her. Her sense of gratitude and loyalty prompted her to become a faithful follower of Jesus. And if you have been saved and delivered from the bondage of sin, you too will become a faithful follower of Jesus. 
You know, let's go back to those 12 big old guys. They were fishermen. They were macho men. They promised Jesus that they would die with him rather than forsake him. Eleven, well, uh, one had already died, but ten of them fled and only John was there at the cross. Oh, to their eternal honor, these women showed great courage and affectionate attachment to Jesus Christ. Those Galilean women had been there and saw Jesus' miracles. They had heard his doctrine, and these women believed his words. They were saved. They were transformed. They were delivered, and they were converted by Jesus Christ. And if you're saved and delivered, it'll be only through and by Jesus Christ. These women began to follow him. Wherever he went, they traveled as much as a hundred miles in any direction with him. These women endured many difficulties and discouragements to faithfully follow Jesus. Oh, aren't you glad that they were willing to follow Jesus? You know, the Calvary's cross is the central point of the incarnation of Jesus into the world. Jesus' death as the Lamb of God who bore the sin of the world was completed. Jesus said, it is finished. And he yielded up the ghost and the veil of the temple was rent. Oh man, I want you to get this and understand for sure. The Romans did not kill Jesus. The Jews did not kill Jesus. They were part of all of those things. But the thing that killed Jesus was my sin and your sin. That was the reason why. So the Bible tells us in John 10 that no man took his life. Jesus said, I lay down my life. I give my life. I give my life a sacrifice that I might take it again. And three days later, sure enough, he did take it again. The glory of heaven is not Jesus as a great ethical teacher, but Jesus, the slain lamb of God who takes away the sins of the whole world. The Bible said that the earthquake and the veil of the temple, you understand, the veil of the temple was four inches thick, woven. And they say that it would take 20 teams of oxen to pull that thing in two. But the rending of the four inch veil showed that Christ's death opened the way to God. The middle wall of partition was torn down. We have an open way through Christ to the mercy seat and the throne of his grace now. We were truly, oh, we got to consider Christ's death. Our hard, stony hearts should be broken when we see how that he, the sinless, eternal son of God, came to earth, took upon him the form of a human, and died and agonized for our sins. And he is now our eternal savior. Oh, I appreciate the Lord's blessings. With hushed hearts, we should stand in the presence of the one supreme act of self-surrender that this entire universe has ever seen. The Roman centurion, he had seen, he had been there at the crucifixions of many people. Oh, and he had never seen anything like this one. He recognized with great emotion the superhuman elements uh, of this crucifixion. The, the clouds uh, were there, the darkness, the eclipse of the sun, the earthquake, and all of those things that happened. My Lord, and he recognized, truly, truly, this man was the Son of God. Oh, Jesus, the only Savior. Amen. Thank God for the suffering of Christ on Mount Calvary's rugged cross. The Bible said in Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Jesus paid our sin debt of the whole world in one unique, unapproachable sacrifice once and for all. Now myriads of sin-sick, 
terror-stricken souls in every century have been able to find refuge through Jesus Christ. Galatians 2 and 20. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You understand? Now I want to go back again and emphasize the fact that those women were afar off but not by choice. Those Roman soldiers, they set a perimeter and they would not allow them to come any farther. Those women came to the clo as close as they could get to Jesus Christ to be near him, to be near their deliverer. They witnessed with intense emotion and intense feelings his sufferings, his agony, and his willing sacrifice. Multitudes of people were around joined in the cry, crucify him, crucify him, and forsook him while he was in that awful trying hour. As the world poured contempt upon Jesus, they faithfully adhered to their Redeemer. Oh my, there is no record there is no record of any of his female followers who were unfaithful to Jesus in his death. Isn't that wonderful? Thank you for your faithful us mothers and women today. Oh my, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Susanna, and many others were unmoved in their loyalty to Jesus Christ. Never did faith, female constancy and faithfulness shine more brightly than at Calvary. These devoted women were still faithful when the disciples all fled except for John. We're going to stay right here. Man, you cannot beat the faithfulness and the fearlessness of a faithful woman. The Bible tells us in John 19, 25, there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, yes, a mother will stay by her son, won't she? So there stood by his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. Notice the Bible mentions Jesus' mother, Jesus' aunt, and Mary Magdalene of Magdala. And the Bible said in Mark 1540, there were also women look on afar off, among whom was Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the less, and of Joseph and Salome. And the Bible said in verse 47, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph beheld where he was laid. Man, they didn't run like Peter. They didn't run like the other disciples. They stayed as close to the cross and to Jesus Christ as they could. And then when they took him down, they were right there and they marched with him and they wept over Jesus as they took him uh, from Calvary over to the garden tomb. And there they were until they, put, they wrapped him in the linen and put those spices on him. And they were there to the very last and they rolled the stone over the grave and before daylight the next morning they were right back there thank God for faithful women who will follow Christ through thick and thin the Bible tells us in John 20 and 1 the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark boy thanks be to God that we can have faithful women that will get up before daylight, way early in the morning. This had, they had to get up around 4 o'clock in the morning and do all these things. They came unto the sepulcher, and they saw the stone taken away from the sepulcher. And the Bible said in verse 18, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. I want you to know there's a whole lot transpired there in those verses from verse 1 to verse 18. And I'm going to go into that shortly here. But the Bible said in Luke 24 and 10, it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna the Mary, and Mary the mother of James and other women that were with them which told these things unto the apostles. We wouldn't have an apostle Paul. We wouldn't have an apostle John were it not for Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary the mother of James and other women that told the disciples the truth that Jesus really was risen from the dead. These devout men accompanied him 
and minister to his needs in Galilee. These women, these devout Galilean women accompanied and ministered to Jesus on his journey to Jerusalem. These devout, godly, faithful women, they were unmoved by popular opinion at Jesus' cross. Mary remained there with him all the way. They didn't leave him when he died. They went all the way to the grave at Joseph's tomb. And the Bible shows us in Matthew 28 and Mark 16, in the earliest dawn of Resurrection Sunday, as she and Salome and Mary, the mother of James, came to Jesus' tomb with sweet spices to anoint Jesus' body, they found an empty tomb. They saw visions of angels, and they were the first human resurrection witnesses. Oh, listen, sister, don't be discouraged. You have served the Lord. You have been faithful through the dark, through the trouble, through the evil. You you have been faithful. Hold on. You're going to be the first human resurrection witnesses when you hold on to Jesus Christ. These unswerving women set the example for all who would afterward believe on him. The Bible tells us, I'm going to run through John chapter 20, verse 2. I'm going to run through it quickly. She ran. She ran to Simon Peter and to John. And she told them, they've taken away the Lord. That's the only thing she could figure out. They've taken away the Lord that person. Peter and John ran, verse 3, as fast as they could to the sepulcher. John outran Peter and came first to the sepulcher. The verses 5, 6, and 7 tells us that they saw the linen clothes and the napkin. They were neatly wrapped and folded. And that, that means there's no evidence that he was stolen. Anybody that's going to steal the body of Jesus, they're going to pick him up and take the whole thing. They're not going to take, they had a hundred pound weight of spices and all that linen. And here it's all rolled and folded up. And the napkin over his face, it's all folded up neatly. And there is no Jesus there. But Mary stood without the sepulcher. Let me back up to verse 10. I'm sorry, I skipped that. Peter and John, you know what they did? They went back home. They went home. The Bible said in verse 10, Peter and John went away again unto their own home. Well, somebody stole him. I don't know what's happened to him, but he's not there. But we do know he. They, they, if they took him, they unwrapped it because the linen cloth is there. The napkin is there, and it's all folded up neat. But Mary stood without at the tomb, at the sepulcher, and she's weeping. She's waiting on Jesus. Oh, if you're listening to me tonight, if you're weeping and waiting on Jesus, I want you to know that Jesus will come to you in your darkest hour. There it is. It's, it's been a horrible weekend. They, she's gone through. She saw Jesus beaten. She saw those horrible things. She saw him crucified. She saw all those things. She saw him placed in the tomb. And now she's there weeping because the tomb is empty. And she doesn't know what has happened to Jesus. And so the Bible said she's there to sepulcher weeping. And she stooped down and she looked in. And when she did, she saw two angels, one at the head, one at the foot, where Jesus had lain. And the Bible said here, the angel said, woman, why are you weeping? And she said, they've taken away my Lord. They've taken away Jesus. Then she turned around and she saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. And Jesus said, woman, why are you weeping? Whom seekest thou? And she supposing him to be the gardener said unto him, Sir, if thou had borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said, Mary. Oh, isn't it wonderful that she recognized that voice? That your loved ones can speak to you like no one else can say your name. And so she, Jesus said, Mary, and she turned and she said unto him, Rabboni. Oh, 
master, master, it's you. You really are alive. I know you were dead. I know I saw you die. I saw them pierce your side. I saw you shed your last bit of blood. I saw them put those spices on you and wrap you up in a hundred pounds of all of that. And there's no way you could have been alive. But you are alive because God has raised you from the dead. And listen. The Bible said in verse 17, Jesus said, touch me not. I am not yet ascended to my father. Go to my brethren and tell them I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and to your God. It's wonderful privilege this Mother's Day evening for us to realize and recognize that Jesus Christ has, is, has won the victory over death, hell, and the grave. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, and he's making intercession for us according to the will of God. Oh, listen. Listen to how wonderful this is. And the Bible said in verse 18, Mary Magdalene, she told the disciples, I have seen the Lord and told him what he said. This former demon-possessed woman was the first resurrection witness. Oh, glory. You are going to get to take part in a glorious resurrection, a catching away of the church one of these days, if you will be faithful like Mary Magdalene. Do you understand this is the last recorded words regarding Mary of Magdala. She went back to Jerusalem and went back to Galilee and lived her life. But I want you to get this. That's the last recorded words about her. But the risen Lord appears to her at first. She doesn't know him. When he speaks her name, Mary, she instantly knows that very familiar voice. Her shock and sorrow and grief immediately turns into joyful, reverent cry. Rabboni, my master. Oh, it's so wonderful to see you alive. She wanted to cling to him. She wanted to cling to Jesus in joyous worship and relief. But he forbids her, saying, touch me not. For I am not yet ascended to my father. She was denied the privilege to touch Jesus. But I want you to listen. And the Bible injects one final scene that many have overlooked. The Bible said in Matthew 28 and 9, as they went to tell his disciples, Jesus met them saying, all hell. And the Bible said they came and held him by the feet and worshiped him. What in the world has happened between Jesus said, don't touch me. I've not ascended. He went that far. That fast, he went all the way to God's throne in heaven and he came back by the time she was going up the road to tell the disciples, oh, don't touch me. He forbids her. She was denied the privilege, but now, amen, he said, oh, hell. And they came and held him by the feet and they worshiped him. She was the first one to get to touch Jesus after his resurrection. She was the first woman to get to worship Jesus after his resurrection. Oh, child of God, continue in your faithfulness. Don't be overwhelmed. Don't be discouraged. Continue to serve the Lord no matter what comes your way. No matter what comes your way, be faithful, Mary Magdalene. The Lord has delivered you and saved you, and he will not forsake you. He will help you. I've got uh, Sister Keen sent me a book. She mailed it to me. Sister Janice Keen mailed me a book the other day. And so I've been reading in that book, and there's a, and there's a reference made to an accident that happened in 1977. And so I started researching that and I was so amazed by it. And I wanna to talk to you about this faithful mother. On Sunday, March the 20th, 1977, there was a group of praying women at a Jerusalem Israel church. They had daily prayer meetings and a sister told the others, that the Lord had placed a heavy burden on her heart for the Canary Islands. These faithful praying women began to intercede for this unknown need for the Canary Islands. 
Tenerife is the largest of the Canary Island archipelago. The Canaries are, are volcanic islands about 40, 50 miles off the coast of northwest coast of Africa, and they belong to Spain for about, about 500 years now. But this was on Sunday, March the 20th, 1977. On Sunday, March the 27th, 1977, one week to the day later, two Boeing 747 passenger jets, a KLM Dutch and a Pan Am collided on the runway at Los Radios, Rodeos Airport on the Spanish island of Tenerife, resulting in 583 fatalities. This accident is the deadliest accident in aviation history. The accident killed all on board of that KLM 4805 flight and most of the Pan Am 1736 with only 61 survivors. Well, there was actually 70 that survived, but uh, the an initial part, but they died later on. And so and many of the OD 61, they had to have skin grafts and surgeries and surgeries and surgeries, and some of them lost their minds. But I want us to get the, the background of this. There was a terrorist bombing at the main airport there uh, on the Canary Islands. And so they, these flights had to be diverted to the Los Rodeos Airport. The airport quickly filled up and became a congested parking lot for 18 jumbo jets. This was a little local airport. Now they've got 18 jumbo jets blocking uh, all of the taxiway. And they're forcing departing planes on the taxiway runway instead. And so then there was very thick fog that covered the runway, causing greatly reduced visibility for the pilots in the, coal, uh, the control tower. The KLM pilot mistakenly believed air traffic control gave him clearance for takeoff. The Pan Am jet, shrouded in fog, still on the runway, about to turn on the taxiway. And at the last moment, the Pan Am pilot saw what was happening and tried to run his jet off into the grass. The KLM pilot had unnecessarily, listen, fueled his jet to capacity during the four hours of unplanned layover. He tried with all his might to get his plane to lift up over the Pan Am 747. The extra 21,000 gallons of high-octane aviation fuel weighing 142,000 pounds was too heavy, and his landing gear ripped the Pan Am jet in two and ripped his fuel tanks wide open, baptizing everyone in aviation gasoline. A horrific bomb fireball explosion immediately engulfed both planes. An unbelievable death and carnage ensued. But I want us to get this. There was the Holy Ghost spoke and said, I have a great burden for those people in the Canary Islands, and we need to pray for them. The horrible news shocked the world and reached the praying church in Jerusalem. In their Sunday evening service there, on March the 27th, 1977, there was an American woman, her name was Ruth Heflin. She stood up and she began to prophesy God had given her words to say, and she said, these are the exact words. Out of the disaster, I will raise up a man with a worldwide ministry. He has not always been willing, but I will now answer his mother's prayers. I will now answer his mother's prayers and give him a ministry that shall bless the entire world. Well, you know, there was a man on that plane named Norman Wayne Williams. Norman Williams' story has been repeated over and over all over the world. Norman Williams was in a Pentecostal Bible school in 1947. He was filled with the Holy Ghost as a 12-year-old boy. 
and preached for one year. He got involved in business and became a very successful businessman. He never left the Lord entirely, but he neglected his spiritual life while he was obtaining this world's good. Not a good idea. And so his godly mother prayed for Norman every day for years and years and years, for 30 years. She continued to believe that Norman would be awakened and obey his calling to full-time ministry. So let me back up and give you the, the background to this. Why is Norman Williams on this plane? Norman sold his business to his partner. His partner was Ted. And uh, he had reservations for Mediterranean cruise that was to take off from the Canary Islands and head over. They were to fly into the Canary Islands and then go on uh, all through the Mediterranean. He had had those reservations for a year and a half. Very hard to get. But when the time come to fly from California to New York and on across the Atlantic Ocean to the Canary Islands, uh, uh, his wife, Ted's wife, was very uneasy about it. And she said, I don't think it's wise for both of us to leave, to go on a cruise and a trip for weeks and be gone. Plus, we have three small boys. I don't think it's a good idea for both of us to be away from our boys for that length of time. And she at emphatically did not want to go. And, and Norman said, well, uh, you know, and so they got to talking. And Ted said, Norman, why don't you go with me? And my wife is not going to go, why don't you just load up and go with me? So they agreed to that. And after, and so now Norman is 52 years old. He's bald and he weighs 240 pounds. He was a very handsome man with a full head of hair, but now time has went by. He thought he was on top of his game. He was on top of the world, but he had no idea that in a matter of hours, his picture would be on the cover of Time Magazine, Newsweek Magazine, numerous world newspapers. Uh, he was... Uh, he was on new, newscasts all over the world. His testimony was made into a book and sold in 14 different languages. Norman Williams' story was filmed into a documentary. Norman went to church in Jerusalem to visit Ruth Heflin and thank God's people for their prayers and for his miraculous survival. I want you to get this. Before Norman, Wayne Williams left for the airport as they had always done before traveling he asked, he went and asked his mom. He said, Mom, I'm getting ready to leave today and go to the airport. Will you pray with me? And she said, let me get my Bible. She always would do this. She would open her Bible. And then they would lay their hands on the Bible and beg God for traveling mercies. And there that day, he said, I had never seen my mother cry in my life. He said, we as a family went to the altar together in Detroit, Michigan when I was a little seven-year-old boy. And I've watched my mother shout and rejoice before the Lord. I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues as a 12-year-old. And we'd been in church all of our lives. But he said, there, all of a sudden, he said, she began to pray. And he said, my mother began to sob uncontrollably. He said, she cried so hard that I had to finish the prayer up. And he said, well, it's just a mother's love. And, uh, but no, it was the intercession of a mother for her son. Thanks be to God for faithful women. Thanks be to God for faithful mothers. She had been praying for this boy for 30 years. And so there, there, there they prayed. And as they went, amen, there is... Those planes crashed head on. The, actually, the, the KLM actually was trying to come up. If he had not had that extra weight, he could have skimmed over them and, and avoided that. But there they did. And that the black box recorder records that the pilot of that KLM plane died taking the Lord's name in vain and cursing horrible oaths. You know, the, the Pan Am pilot 
This, the front of the plane was cut off and the plane just fell down. And so the pilot of the Pan Am plane fell to the ground. Some of those, that was where most of the survivors were. And he became a devout Christian because he knew God spared his life. But he said the most horrendous thing there the, with the impact and the fires and the explosion was to see people that were covered in aviation fuel and the flames and covering them and they were cursing and taking the Lord's name in vain as they were breathing their last breaths here on earth. Oh, God. And, and so, you know, when we look, and he said, he remembered talking to an assembly of God woman that was on that plane. And she said, she stepped out in the aisle and she said, the Holy Ghost spoke to her and said, get back. And she stepped back to her seat and she said, there came a flaming piece of metal flying down through that aisle. And then she stepped back out into the aisle and she said, I became like a gazelle. I leaped over seats and I made my escape only because the Holy Ghost empowered her and she said, I ran like a gazelle. Norman's prayers and Norman's mother's prayer came to him. And he said, I began to scream Jesus repeatedly. And he said, I was yelling over and over, Lord, I stand on your word. He said, my briefcase was under my seat and my Bible was in it. It was on fire. All of that was on fire. But here, he said, I said, Lord, I stand on your word. I stand on your word. And he said, I saw a black piece of metal. The lights were out. And he said, all I could see was flames and smoke or anything. And that black piece of metal was coming. I knew that it was going to hit me. And so he said, I just bowed back and lifted my hands. And that metal just skimmed over my hands. And he said, when I looked up, there was a hole in the top of the plane. And you understand the ceilings of a 747 is 10 foot. Plus, you're going up. But he said, I had my own personal rapture. I do not know. I was standing there. I looked up. And the next thing I knew, I was through, through the ceiling at 10 foot height and on up three to the five foot on top of a 64 foot 747. I'm standing on top. And he said, there I was. I slid down off the top down onto the wing and he said I saw others as they tried to jump and they were jumping on top of one another and killing one another and he said it was so slick with all the fuel and gasoline and he said I quickly ran over and I got out past the engines he said the engines never stopped they were still going and fire coming and he said I got and tired to that and he said I jumped off 35 feet to the ground. He broke his foot, but when he landed on the ground for the first time in many, many years, he was speaking in tongues as the Spirit gave him utterance. And he said, I looked down. He said, I had blood on my clothes where I had cut myself, but there was no fire on me. There was not any singe of anything. My clothes were fully intact, and he knew that God had intervened for him and brought him through. Oh, thank you, faithful mothers. Thank you, praying women. Thank you for your faithfulness to the house of the Lord. Listen. In the next three and a half years, he flew over 500,000 miles all over the world, and he saw thousands of people saved according to the prophecy out of the disaster. I will raise up a man with a worldwide ministry. He has not always been willing, but I will now answer his mother's prayers. I want to speak to you if you will allow me. I know that there's been several people from different states, different nations that are watching these broadcasts that we're doing live here from the sanctuary. And we got a precious text message uh, while I preached there Thursday night from Anita that grew up here in this church. And she said, thank you, Brother Philip, for your preaching. Then she sent a text message to my wife and said, 
Brother Philip and Sister Carol, will y'all please pray for me? I'm trying to get back to God. She lives in Florida. She's been away for many years. But oh, you know what it is, Anita? It's the prayers of your precious mother. Sister Jetty prayed and prayed and prayed for you to be saved. And I want you to know you can and you will and you can have the blessing and the victory of God because Jesus wants you to be saved and to go to heaven with your precious mother. I know that there are others I've seen and know and I feel in my heart that there are others that the Lord God is dealing with you. You need right now to surrender your life and give yourself to Jesus. Don't let it be that your last words that you will be taking the name of the Lord in vain and cursing by those. When you are in trouble, call out Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, he will save you. He will help you. I don't know what's going to take place in this country. We've never seen such a time as this. But I want you to know we can stand upon Jesus Christ as solid rock and the word of God as a sure foundation. And there, Mr. Norman, what is it? I'm standing on the word of God. I stand on your word. You are the faithful one. And you're not willing that any should perish but that all would come to repentance. And I pray for those that are being like Norman Williams. You've been slack concerning the promises, but you were raised in the house of God and you know the word of the Lord and you had those experiences and your mothers and your fathers had prayed for you and the Lord is not going to let you be lost, but he's going to let you find your way back home. Oh, we open with arms wide open to our prodigal sons and daughters to come back to Jesus this night. Oh, blessed be the Lord for your love and mercy that kept this man. Everybody around him were instantly killed. And yet he didn't even have a singe on his clothes. He had a suit, a shirt. He didn't have a tie on, but uh, there he was. I've seen the pictures of him. You can see blood on his clothes where he was cut going up through that top, but there was no sense, no burn on him. And he said when he was there in the hospital at Tenerife Island, and the doctors, they began, he began to tell them what happened. And he said, there is no doubt that your faith saved you. I want you to know your faith in Jesus Christ will save you. Get on the rock, Jesus Christ. Get a hold of the word of the Lord. Let him save you. Let him deliver you. You can be like Mary Magdalene. You can have his love and mercy bubbling over in your life. We're going to pray with you right now, our Father, in Jesus' name. Oh, God, I know that I'm speaking to hearts and lives all across this country. Lord, I know that you've dealt with me. This is Mother's Day. What better day for a prodigal son, a prodigal daughter to find her way back home. Come to Jesus. Come to what you know is true and real. And to find Jesus Christ to be the friend and the Savior that he was. He didn't condemn Mary Magdalene because she had seven demons. He delivered her from it. He didn't condemn her for the wickedness of her life. He saved her and delivered her from it. And Lord, I pray that our people far and wide would hear your voice and be born again this night. And we plead the blood of Jesus Christ in their behalf. We stand firmly upon the word of the Lord for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. God bless you is our prayer.